The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. We are back talking vintage sports in the zone. I'm Ralph Tycho, and we have a quartet of terrific folks who go way back, have been at Comfortably Zone for like three or four years, and uh, this is a nice reunion show. Um, welcome, Hal Bach. Hello, Hal. Good to be here, Ralph. Good to have you. Uh, good to have all of us. Uh, George Case the Third. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Alan Blumkin. In the words of Mel Allen, hello there, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hello there, Alan Blumkin. Great to hear all your voices. And uh, David Hubler, you've got some nice words too. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Good. Um, I hinted off air that I wanted to uh, put a little angle on this show, and then we'll talk about uh, the regular sports and all. I just want individually a few words on what you're making of all of this. Is this not surreal? It is. Tell me what's most surreal, and we'll start with Hal Bach. All this that's going on. It's changed all of our lives. <laughs> a year like no other, I'll tell you that. Well, we've successfully completed almost nine months, so that only gives us three more months to, to live through. But uh, it has been a very strange year, you got to say that. And uh, I think I'll, I'll feel uh, naked without a mask when this thing is over, believe me. Uh, it's okay. impacted our lives uh, dramatically, and... Uh, not necessarily for the better. Uh, it's been a difficult time. But we'll get okay. through it like we get through everything else. Uh, that's my thought. Um, Alan Blumkin. Uh, hopefully things will change for a better on November 3rd when the current occupant of the White House is beaten. He, he's responsible for a lot of the mess that we're in this country is in right now. Most of it. Tally and I both got the expression negligent homicide from you five, six months ago. So you you were right on, on it about that. Um, what he's doing is, is crazy. Uh, George Case III. Okay, well, I'm, I want to put my uh, little thing in here. Uh, six months ago, you wear a mask into a store and you probably get arrested for wearing a mask. Now right. you go in without a mask and you get arrested for not having a mask. <laughs> so we've gone we've gone full circle on that. And uh, you know I'm I'm uh, like you guys. It's uh, a year that uh, you know I don't hope we never have again. I happen to have on the, my refrigerator a Happy New Year card from my kids when they were over in Switzerland. And, you know, it's a Happy New Year 2020. Well, you know, obviously we all entered 2020 with good thoughts, but it certainly hasn't turned out that way. That could, Happy New Year 2020 could be the all-time oxymoron. Yep, absolutely. So, David Hubler, please. Yeah, I, you know, the one thought I've had all along on this thing is because um, uh, thinking back to when I was a kid, uh, the big fear was polio. Uh, you couldn't go swimming in a, a public pool. You couldn't drink from a public water fountain. Uh, you saw kids on television uh, in, in iron lungs, and the parent, my parents, my my mother is, is one was one of them, uh, was very very frightened about just going out for us going out as kids. And now here we are as members of the senior set. And we're experiencing a similar situation. It's almost like two bookends, you know? We were young kids, fearful of a, of a, of a great epidemic, and now we're more senior folks and fearful of another pandemic. Uh, there's a certain symmetry to it, which I don't really like. 
Um, that's that's my thought. Also, one other thing: when I wear my mask, it means it's one day less I have to shave. So that's a nice <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I can't figure out. I go into some of these stores, and some people who know me, you know, they'll say, "Hey, hi, George. How are you?" I say, "How the heck do they know who I am? I got a mask on." Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I, I can't tell who's who, but you know, some people do. But I, I know myself. I mean, you know, we have to wear them here in the East. You know, most everybody does, I guess. But you know, you go into stores and you got to have it now. If you're if you're outside or if you're in the car or whatever, you don't have to have it. But I know as soon as I get out of a store, I got to take it off. I just don't like wearing them. Well, you know, one other thing that it does, as you point out, George, correctly. Um, we are recognizable with our masks on, which means that all of the old Lone Ranger shows were be- built on a fallacy. No one ever recognized it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> You're right about that, David. <laughs> That's right. Mm-hmm. But they did recognize... But don't forget, the Lone Ranger had his eyes covered. We have our mouth <laughs> and nose covered. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. The thing that crazes me that with all the revolution revelations of when Trump knew about it back in April, talking to Woodward, this, that, and the other thing, yesterday he hold and maybe today another one, inside, no masks, co-mingling with each other, no safe distances. Is this cra- a guy who wants to get elected? Why would he spread disease to the people who are with him? And why would those people show up? Is there something called natural selection? Has that gotten lost? Well, um, I'll tell you one thing, Ralph, and the rest of you guys. If Trump told a, a bunch of his followers to jump off a cliff, they would. They're impervious. I got my own family. My brother, they're impervious to reason, and uh, the excuses they give are just beyond beyond comprehension. Right. Right. Well, you know, you know um, one of the interesting things about this whole thing, and it's it's not been even mentioned very often or explained, but Trump is known as a germaphobe. He is petrified of germs. And for years he was like this. Now all of a sudden he's out there without wearing a mask, telling his friends he don't need them. Um, it's just a strange, strange turnabout. Uh, from everything we know, he's really not playing with the full deck. <laughs> well, all you have to do is read some of his some of his uh, his comments. I mean, they're just off the wall. He he his sentences are disconnected. He uses words inappropriately. Uh, my wife, the psychologist, thinks he's got uh, early uh, onset uh, Alzheimer's. Right. That's, is that that's not even so early, is it? At seventy-four. Well, or no, whatever? you're right. That's true. That's true. But uh, his father died of dementia, and uh, he yes. may be on his way. I don't know. Yes, I've been reading Mary Trump's book. Um, I, yeah. Just, if you want to read a book that does a great deal of explaining. This man, that's the book to read. Cause she's that's a, a week ago, yeah. You're right there. She's a clinical psychologist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she is. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you turn a page and you say, wow, that's why he did this. Wow. No wonder he acts like that. It's, it's, it's revelatory. Okay. Hey, before we talk a little sports, I yes, just want please. your opinions on what's going to happen if he loses, and um, is there a chance that he could just simply not leave office? I believe that on November 3rd, the early returns, which will be from uh, people who show up at the polls, will favor him, and he will declare victory. He'll say, I've been reelected. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Uh, And he will ignore the mail-in ballots, which won't be counted until well after November 3rd. And that will create a constitutional crisis. And the hope is in this House that the uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts will step in and swear in Joseph Biden as the 46th President of the United States. 
but who knows? Uh, I think we're going to have, uh, it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be a very dramatic uh, time after November 3rd. That's my belief. Well, well whatever, he ha- whatever happens, he, if they inaugurate Biden, Trump will be the first person since John Quincy Adams refused to go to uh, Andrew Jackson's first inauguration. Oh, very that's, interesting. That's pretty impressive, yeah. 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 Um, well, he won't. He wouldn't be invited. <laughs> that's the damn sure. He, what? It, there's a possibility that uh, this election may come down to the worst constitutional crisis since the Civil War. If he refuses to leave the White House. Who, who's going to? Who? Uh, what, uh, park police? Who's going to oust him from the White House? And what will be the result of that among all of these right wingers out there with their guns? Uh, it could be disastrous. Uh, sure. You know, you know, David, I, I'm, I'm not going to jump in here except the fact that I hope that that doesn't happen because I of think it would be very, a very yeah. scary time. And I think that's what all of us are maybe afraid of, that all of a sudden you get insurrection and you get more riots and you get, you know, killings and all that kind of stuff. And whether or not Trump wins or loses, I think, you know, that, that whatever's going to happen. But I hope it's I hope it's more of a personally, I hope it's more of a landslide. So there's not either way. So there's not, you know, this fear of what may happen. And if it's real close, I agree with you guys, and they have to go into the, you know, all the write-in ballots and all that kind of stuff. I, I mean, it, it could be a, a, a horrible time from November 3rd to, you know, January 20th. We might be without any kind of a president, and the lawyers are having a field day, and the, the insurrectionists are going around and going crazy, and the, and the rioters, uh, you know, they're going crazy, and then we got we got blood in the streets, and I, it, it, that part of it really scares me. Yeah, well, you're right, except for one thing, George, one, one point. Um, Trump will be president until noon on the 20th of January, come what may. Well, yeah, so, I know, but you know, you're talking about you know evicting the guy or getting him out of office. Yeah, I, I agree. No, with that. you wouldn't be getting him out on on November fourth. You'd be getting no. him out on the twenty first of January. Twenty. Right, right. Or tw- but but it, it would be held up in the courts, and like you're saying, if, it could if be, yeah. the Supreme Court has to get involved, and you know, there's all this all this discussion. I mean, in our lifetime and what we've talked, we we've never had this possibility not that i can remember uh so it is a an unprecedented time just like what we're going through every day and now on top of that now we got to have a you know the presidential thing to be concerned about yeah well of course you know al gore al gore stepped aside um after the florida recount and he did he did the right thing because he preserved literally preserved the union from a, a huge split um, he could have contested that for months on end. Uh, yeah, I forget, David. How long? How long was that? Was a couple? Was that a couple weeks? That was all that hanging chads and all that kind oh, of stuff. Oh, it went into it went into January. I Did believe. it go into January? Okay, I, believe, I, I didn't. I read. think so. I yeah, think so. Right. But I mean, yeah. he did. He did the right thing. Uh, even though many people were disappointed and many people believed that it was stolen from him by the Supreme Court, but in this case. Um, Trump is not going to play ball. He's not. He's not a no, good loser. No, no he's yeah. a very bad loser. He's not yeah. going to walk away willingly. Uh, no, my wife right. thought that they'd have to send in the uh, the militia to get rid of him. You know, the yes. state, mm-hmm. the state uh, militia. Uh, yeah, well, then, you know, uh, and then once, I hope it does, once he's I hope it no longer come president, yeah. even next once he's no court. longer president, he can be subjected to arrest from New York State. Or, right. That's right. That's that's the, right. That's the big fear in his uh, in his head. Even right. even R- R- Richard Nixon did not contest uh, uh, Kennedy's election back in 1960, even though he thought that there was a, an awful lot of voting fraud there. Right. Hmm. Well, you know, um, David, you mentioned that you thought it was a good idea that Gore took the you didn't say the high road, but that he ended the. Uh, speculation and what have you 
it's the same thing Nixon or Ford did when he pardoned Nixon, and I think and then lost the that, election, yeah. and that basically begot what what we've had since in terms of presidents, Reagan included, sitting in the White White House basement while while Bush gives arms to the Contras, and each president has had his fa- fallibles that were brought on by Nixon getting away with, with his stuff. Well, but yes, but each president, up until this one, put the, in, a, in his own fashion, put the country above himself. And regardless of which party you favor or which president you dislike, that's been true up until now. Uh, this, man, this man is out for himself and only himself. They, they, always has been and always will be. Every other anybody who any any New Yorker and and Hubbler, I consider you a New Yorker and Alan I do too. Is a New I Yorker. do too. <laughs> uh, any New Yorker knows who Trump is and what he was and where he comes from and his whole history. Right. And it's not, none of this is a surprise to those of us who live in New York. And I'll tell you who knew about him right from the get go. The owners of the National Football League, who told him to take a hike when he wanted to buy teams, and that's right, Hal. He's had that. Uh, he's had that on his mind forever. He hates the NFL because of that. Also, uh, because uh, he... they rejected him. Hal, you're not allowed be... to reject him. You have to embrace him in his mind. So, Hal, even uh, the... New Yorkers know all about him. And yeah, he about try him. to force the USFL team they own to get into the NFL, and they. They sued for antitrust, and the they were the uh, USFL was awarded one dollar, and triple triple damages was three dollars. And then he I tried have a friend who works for the NFL and who wanted to give it to. Uh, I have a friend who works for the NFL who wanted to give it to him out of his wallet right then and there. Here, take the three bucks. <laughs> yeah, they have. The, the, they, uh, yeah, but I try to explain these to uh, my brother and uh, uh, another friend of mine who you know. Take the uh, dealing as an offense, uh, and they won't watch this. They won't watch that. And I try to tell them that Trump is, you know, is out for revenge. That's all he ca- That's all he cares about. And I, I said before the election in 2016, when my brother asked me what I thought about after he wins, if he won, I told my brother, I said, don't trust this guy. He's he's a, the all-time biggest scumbag of the highest order. Yes, well, his, his hatred, yeah. his hatred for Obama, is absolutely crazed to the point where um, he'll say anything, even if it doesn't make any sense. He still hints at the birther thing every now and again. So, um, all right, we uh, we're out of the candy store of life. So let's get back into it. Um, Some sports. How Bach? Anything that's uh, impressive about the way the baseball season in particular is going, more so than you expected? As the last time we talked, we were all of us appalled by the runner at second base in extra innings. Michael Duca. Somebody was talking to me today about uh, what I think of baseball this season, and and I told them I don't believe that this is baseball. This is not. This is some made-up sport that uh, that uh, uh, sells itself as baseball. But this is not the baseball that I grew up with, that I fell in love with. This is a some kind of a hybrid that they've uh, forced it on us. Uh, the, uh, the the uh, seven-game series between two teams. Some teams you never see the whole season. Uh, you just It's not the same. It's not the game that I fell in love with. And uh, the ban on second base is just an abortion. That is the worst idea ever come up with, they've ever come up with. Uh, and you know what, Hal, just, Hal and, and David, uh, Hal and uh, Ralph, I, I want to I mention one thing about talking about baseball. I mean, I, I love the game. I've been around all my life. I just cannot warm up 
to baseball this year at all. I mm-hmm. just can't. I'm with you. I can't. I can't stand the crazy fan noise that's recorded. I can't stand cardboard cutouts in the stands. I can't. I can't stand the runner on second base. I can't stand seven wow. inning doubleheaders. I mean that kind of right. stuff just drives me crazy, and I have no interest. I don't think I've watched more than a couple innings. Because I see a ball game, and I used to love to watch ball games and see the fans react and see the players react. And now all you see is empty seats with cardboard cutouts and crazy piped-in manufactured noise, which doesn't make any sense to me at all. And I, my, my preference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just you know, I just can't get into it. I'm sorry. I just. I love the game. I love sports, but I'll be damned if I can get interested in baseball, as you're saying, how with this hybrid or whatever it is, it's just not. It's just not Major League Baseball. You know, this is the first time. This is the first time in many, many years that I have not opened the paper first to the sports section to find out the ball scores from the night before. Right. Um, I I do it as an afterthought now. Oh, there were some games last night. Uh, it's it's. A, oh, I think the Yankees won a game the other day against the Orioles with that runner on second base nonsense. It's awful. Um, the worst part of not the worst. One of the worst parts for me is that one of the things I always said about the, one of the great differences between the NFL and Major League Baseball is that the hometown fans get to see their teams play. And if they're lucky enough to play in the World Series, they get to see them play there, too. This year, let's say Seattle gets into the World Series for the first time. The games are going to be played where, in Florida or Arizona? No, Texas. I mean, Texas. Texas. The World yeah. Series is going to be in Texas. Okay. Yeah, some crazy <laughs> thing like Texas. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's just an abomination of the game, and I don't, even if my Yankees were to win the World Series, I wouldn't even count that as a number. I'd put an asterisk up there. Right. Uh, it's just terrible. It's just awful. I, I think, David, you're right. I mean, I think they have to put asterisks on everything. I mean, you know. Well, ha- the whole season. You know, they're only playing, what, 60 games? They're only playing, uh, another thing. you know. Yeah, and, and then some of the games have already been canceled. I don't know whether they make them up or whatever oh, yeah, they do. They but but uh, you know the the runner on second. I mean, if he if he scores, then you have to have an asterisk to me on that. If they if they win a double header, and each game has gone seven innings, they got to put an asterisk on those things, and batting averages and pitching ERAs and all that kind. Of, to me, it's it just it's just a crazy way. And I said earlier, I said my preference would be to have no season rather than this crazy mm-hmm. thing that we're. Being subjected to watching right, George. Yep, You're yep, on target yep. 100%. That's, that's what I had hoped. I have a question. But they would just guys. back away and say, let this run its course. This yep. is a pandemic, and we'll see you next year, you know? Yep. Yeah, but they right, decided right. that they were going to fight it. And as yeah. a result, we had the Yankees win a game the other night when a guy was on second to start yeah, the extra right. innings, went to third on a wild pitch, and scored on a sacrifice fly. What an exciting rally that was, you know? <laughs> it really that was. was right? catch. That was a great catch by the center fielder, though. He made a great catch that was totally yeah, meaningless. Yeah. But yeah. You know, I have one question to ask, because I I still haven't been able to understand or, or the reasoning. They're playing with 26 ball players this year instead of the t- normal 25. Come the World Series, uh, they may, or not even the World Series, but supposedly after September 1st, they were allowed to bring up more players. What in the world is the reasoning behind playing seven inning doubleheaders? These guys are uh, are major league ball players. They should they always played nine innings and more. Uh, it's just incredible to me that okay, it's seven innings. We're going home now. That's the end. Yeah. Goodbye. Not baseball. Yeah. It's not my baseball. No, no. no. I, I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Yep. I agree with David. I could, can't. Get my uh, arms wrapped wrapped around. I've watched absolutely very little on television. I've listened to very little on the radio. Uh, everything you guys uh, said, I, I believe, is true. And the thing that the other thing that drives me nuts uh, is the uh, pitchers. A friend of mine told me they may set the record for uh, 
pitching changes this year. You see four or five pitchers pitch a shutout. I mean, it's it's just unbelievable. And the other yeah. great rule that they had that occurred twice in the last week, uh, Erasmo Rodriguez, Ramirez pitched the last three innings for the Mets in an 18-1 game and got the save. <laughs> and uh, Bryce Harvey, who is a sort of former player, Brian Harvey, pitched four Whoa. innings in that brave, brave game where they got 29s, and he's got the save. They're both in for the West Littleton Award because he was the pitcher. David, you probably remember this pretty well. When the Orioles lost to Texas 33, he got a yeah, save yeah. in that. Oh, God. yeah. It's, it's absolutely <laughs> insane. Yeah. This the last three innings, the pitcher, right? 14-man pitching stabs. So it leaves you three men, three, four men on the base, uh, on, the, on the bench, and, you know, the game goes long, you've uh, you run out of uh, – uh, You've run out of uh, options. Yeah, it's it, it, it's it's not it's not baseball. It really isn't. Um, and I feel sorry for the two for the fans of the two teams that make it to the World Series because they're not going to the fans are not going to run. Well, some will, of course, but it, not only that, but there are a lot the of stadium. marginal players. There are, there are an awful lot of players who are masquerading as big leaguers uh, who really have no business in the big leagues and and. Many of them uh, have pit, been pitching in games here in New York. It's just it's like uh, war, it's war, wartime time baseball. Wartime baseball. It is. Yeah, that's a very <laughs> good point. It's like wartime baseball. You're right. <clears throat> Books will be written about this season. Oh yeah, but no question about but that. But they'll be very short books. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a short season. Right. <laughs> but I root for the Pirates and the 14 and 32 at this point, and I don't think they have a – I think they might go the rest of this so-called season without winning a game. <laughs> that would be hard to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. They're capable but, of it. I, yeah. I, I compared this team uh, to, when they went 4-17 and 17 as a start – to the 52 Pirates who won 42 games all year. Yeah. Your first year following it, Alan? No, 51 was correct. the first year. Okay, your first year with baseball cards. How about that? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was it. No, I, 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 I'm afraid this whole this whole thing is is a wash. Um, the, the only uh, the only saving grace to me is because the owners are, s are such avarice people that they're not making any money on the uh, on this stupid plan uh, because there's no there are no fans showing up. But, uh, but well, uh, they're they're making TV money. Exactly. Yeah. And, Right. Hand over fist. Oh, and, and by now, the way, now does that does that money still come in the same way, or or is that all you know discounted or prorated or whatever they do? You no, know, I'm that, not worried. It, I'm not worried about them any more than they're worried about. But us. I'll tell you what I think they're doing. I said if you watch a game, the the number, the, and that's another thing I've always said that it was much better than the NFL because the NFL is full of commercials all throughout the game, but. They're, they're showing commercials on a split screen. There are commercials left, right, and center on any baseball game you watch. I've watched it with the Nats. I've watched it on the, uh, ESPN games. The, the, it's just commercial after commercial after commercial, right. and it drives you crazy. They don't even wait for the half innings anymore. Yeah. And every well, you're time, right about that, David. I've noticed that, too. I mean, I think everybody probably noticed that those – what you call those split screens because the the action's going on. You want to watch the game, and instead you get a miniature version of the game, but it's mm -hmm. a full screen of the commercial. Yeah. Also, uh, you know, any time you, you 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 hear the phrase, "This call to the bullpen is brought to you by whoever," it's a four five right. minute break. And you know, right. you know, when they decide they were going to speed up the game, they took away the intentional walk. You know that they had a game the other seconds. night. The, the Mets game the other night ended on a reversal, call reversal on a pickoff at first base. It was the sixth review in the game. They want to speed up the game. Six reviews of close calls. Well, I mean, yeah. this is this has become ridiculous, you know. 
And whatever happened to that rule they instituted again for speeding up the game where the batter could only take one foot out of the batter's box between pitches? Oh, sure. They're walking look, uh, all look over. They're wa- yeah, they're walking all over. It's fixing their gloves. Uh, it's just an abomination. Well, you know what I miss the most? You know what I miss the most? It's uh, not the most, but I miss it a lot. Is between pitches, or when there's a foul ball hit into a stand, into the stands, and some kid gets the ball, or and he gives it to his little sister or whatever. Pure joy, people enjoying themselves. Kids enjoying baseball. How are they going to have, uh, how are kids going to be fans 20 years from now? What are their memories? I watched the TV game and the cardboard box, the cardboard thing. and You know, you can't really develop a fandom as a kid unless you've been there, smelled the grass, seen the players up front, gotten autographs or whatever. And, um, you know, that's good. Yeah, you're right. I covered covered 30 World Series for the Associated Press. It's a lot. I have better memories of the times I went to ball games with my father when I was seven and eight years old than I have of those 30 World Series. I can remember plays that I saw then that I can't really remember that from the World Series that I covered. Because it's just, and you you made the point, uh, uh, Ralph, uh, there, there is a certain magic for a kid at the ballpark, looking around and seeing the green grass and, and seeing the stands packed with fans. It's a magical time for a young person. And, uh, that's lost. How in our day, all you had was black and white television. Yep. And so uh, the first time I went to Yankee Stadium, uh, 1953, or 67 years ago, uh, I was was stunned by seeing green grass, hearing Bob Shepard over, you know, it was was a total experience. My parents took me and my brother. Now batting for the Yankees. Yes, and number number 77, Alan... Lumpkin. And number, number and also, uh, uh, when I was 12, if it was a day game, me and a friend of mine would take a bus from Belrose, Queens, a bus to the train stations that took to take two trains to go up there by ourselves. Now you can't, these kids can't go across the street after school by themselves. Yeah, I, do, I, I, my friend and I went down to the stadium by ourselves very early on, and we had a much easier trip than you did. But I mean, again, it was a question. We used to, we used to go to Madison Square Garden at night for Knicks games and Rangers games uh, before we were even in high school. It's a whole different world out there, buddy. I know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the old well, yeah, yeah. Same right. Marty Rose that I I told you guys about earlier in the show, and Hal knew from his Associated Press days. He and I, when we Wilt's first year, I think it was '59, they played a um, triple overtime. He and I went. We were 13 years old. It was a night game, obviously, and. Um, The Knicks had a triple overtime. There were no cell phones. We couldn't call home. We didn't get home until an hour and a half later. But our parents weren't all that worried because we had younger brothers. So if anything happened to us, um, no, that's just us. Uh, It was just just different times. It was. A 13-year-old kid wouldn't be out at night um, under any No, absolutely not. No, no, no. no. And, and the uh, the other thing is I went to, used to go to all the double letters in the old Madison Square Garden, generally on Tuesday nights, for $3, $3.50, sat in the mezzanine, knew not to take row A because you shouldn't, you had to look through a, a, a rails, but not to take row F because you couldn't feel, you couldn't uh, see the scoreboard at the three fifty, we got two. We got two games. It was incredible, and then they moved into the new place, and that was the end of that. 
Yeah, yeah well, during the holiday festival and things, you could get three college games in an yeah. afternoon. Oh, they, they, they were great. Admission. Uh, I can remember the holiday festivals, the NITs. Mm -hmm. I saw basketball teams come in. I saw the Van Arsdale Twins in Bellamy with Indiana. I saw Cincinnati playing with Oscar. Absolutely. I saw Ohio State coming in with Lucas and Newell and those guys. We, uh, what a, you could not be a sports fan if you, you had know, there Murray was no, Rose. There was if you no had ESPN Murray Rose then. getting your tickets. <laughs> there was no ESPN then. So I went to the Garden. Uh, I was a freshman at NYU, and I was hot shot. I was working on the school newspaper, and they put me in the press box. And that was oh, nice. Wow. Not not courtside, but upstairs in the press box. Yeah. That's fine. And uh, they were playing uh, a doubleheader, I think, and University of Seattle was playing in the first game. And there's this guy wearing number 22 named Elgin Ooh. Baylor. I never saw anybody fly before. I saw him fly. It was unbelievable. I, th I thought, holy Mac, well, look at the way this guy's playing. And, and it was, a, you know, it was a, quite an awakening for me that there is more basketball at that time than just New York and just the East Coast and even just the Midwest. But they play basketball in Seattle, too. And this guy was unbelievable. And it was a real awakening for me to the to the skills that some of these young men had. And uh, they were great. They were acrobatic. I, I remember watching Julius Irving, Dr. J. He would take off from the foul line like a helicopter and dunk. And it was just amazing. It was it was quite a sight for uh, for a sports writer and for a, for a kid to watch I those kind of players. I was there in uh, 1959 at the uh, holiday festival. I saw Oscar Robinson pour in 50 against Iowa. And uh, I just fell uh, you know, in love with Oscar Robinson. I watched him on the pros almost every time I could get it. He, yeah. To me, he still, you know, they forget him and Weston Baylor and Bob Pettit. Some of these guys... Yeah, it's like uh, the Jurassic Age, and uh, yeah, good point. Good way to say it. Yeah, and, and, the, and the Knicks draft and the Knicks draft Paul Hogue. Yeah. <laughs> well, I saw Paul Hogue when Cincinnati came in to play Duquesne. This is why in Pittsburgh they played in the Pittsburgh Fieldhouse. Paul, there's no clock back then. Paul Hogue tr had a little trouble getting up and down the court. Yeah, and the Knicks draft him. Of course, they um, they draft everybody. Yeah, I mean, their whole history outside of three three pieces uh, is pretty horrible. Hey, I want all four you of you guys your reaction if I say Connie Hawkins. Start with you, Hal. Fabulous player! Oh, what a fabulous player! I saw him play uh, uh, high school ball here in New York. Um, there was a there was a game in Madison Square Garden. Connie Hawkins, and I guess he played for boys. No, did he play for boys? No. Yeah, Wingate. No, Roger Wingate, Brown played that's, for Wingate. No, Roger Brown played for Wingate. Roger right. Brown played for Wingate. Connie Hawkins played, I think, for boys, but I could be mistaken. Yeah. No, you're right. No, you're right. He was boys but at the time. What, yeah. an out, what, a, what a show those two guys put on. And I yeah, remember well, talking now to, it's boys and girls. I remember talking to Billy Cunningham. I remember talking to Billy Cunningham, the great Hall of Fame player, from the uh, Philadelphia 76ers. And I said, you know, i tell you how old I am. I remember when you played at Erasmus Hall High School. Ar oh, you Bernie remember Kersner. me at Erasmus? Oh, Bernie Kersner. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> am I right, Hal Bach? He played for Bernie Kersner at Erasmus, the coach. I don't remember him. Oh, he I don't was remember my him. I remember, I remember Billy Cunningham, but I don't remember him. But, yeah, uh, I, have, right. I have a story, a quick story about uh, 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 Connie Hawkins, Billy Burwell. Billy Burwell was also played for boys, and uh, he was a strong center in the uh, late 50s. And I had, uh, because I was not doing very well in school, one, or one reason or the other, I was the Clinton cheerleader. And I used to dress up like as a girl, and, because he didn't have any girls, and um, entertain the crowd. And uh, it got so 
popular that they insisted that I come with them to the Madison Square Garden for the city player championships, uh, where I had to come up with a whole new routine, you see. <laughs> and so we knew that Billy Burrow would come out with the, with the boys' high school team, and he would stand there under the basket and hold two basketballs, one in each hand, palm them. And then as the players went past and shot layups, afterwards he would just turn around and dunk both basketballs. And this was supposed to intimidate the other, other team, which it did in many cases. So they had me come. Uh, we worked out a deal where they taped two basketballs to my hands. And I came out with a, a basketball jersey that said girls. Uh, very prescient, by the way, playing boys. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I came Precious. out first. I came out first with the Clinton team, and I'm standing there under the basket, you know, all five foot seven of me, and I'm holding these two basketballs. Right? And Billy Burrow and the boys team comes out, and he looks at me down the court, just down, and he d- doesn't say a word. He just sort of stares at me like, what the hell? <laughs> well, we beat them. We beat them that night and went down to win the city championship uh, the night the next night it was against Wingate. So I had, well, I had a I had a, a part in that upset. Well, in Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Did you have nice legs? I did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you see not not long precious. ones. They weren't very precious. long, but they were. <laughs> in 1960, my high school, Martin Van Buren, somehow made the final four. And so, uh, you know, so we go into the garden. They're playing Columbus, and Wingate is playing boys. And boys did a number on them, and Columbus did a number on us. So we w- went back to the next day because Pitt was still playing for a third place game, which they didn't get. Uh, Columbus beat boys twenty. Boys beat Columbus. I'm sorry, twenty one to fifteen. That's how they figured. The only way they can control them is by, you know, using the, the four corners. The four corners, exactly. Mm. But uh, um, you know, he, he, George Case, uh, let me get get George Case's impression a little bit of Connie Hawkins. Uh, just uh, you know, I'm I'm with you guys. Great player, one of the greatest, and uh, you know, I got caught up in all that damn scandal or yes. whatever it was, yes. and. Uh, it just it just you know ruined him as far as uh, his reputation and great. But I think in uh, in the annals of basketball history, you know, my opinion, he's got to be one of the top ten of all time. Just a great great player. I happened to see him play, and Alan, I don't know whether you ever saw him play, but I saw him play in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I did. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, uh, when I was first in the athletic footwear business. Uh, uh, Johnny Clark, who was with the Converse, he was the Pittsburgh Condors coach. And, uh, you know, Connie Hawkins was playing, uh, you know, in, in Pittsburgh at, toward the end of his career. Uh, but, you know, his his uh, his youth days as a basketball player in the playgrounds of, of New York were absolutely legendary. I thought he went yeah. to the ABA. Yeah, Connie Hawkins. They finally let him into the. Well, he has so there's there's a book out uh, that was published a number of years ago called Foul. Bob Wolf. Yeah, which is the the whole David Wolf. The, David Wolf. David Wolf. The whole. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, David the whole uh, uh, you know story of Connie Saga. Hawkins and, and and the band and had they had to sue the NBA to let him back in. Right. That's right. right. You're right. Yep. And uh, of course, going back a bit further, even before our time in '51, when City College won both the NIT and the NCAA, the three guys on the on the City College team uh, were were found to have been dumping the games. There's an excellent book. They There's an excellent book I read uh, several months ago called The City Game. And it's a whole thing, the whole story is about CCMY, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, I recommend it highly. Do you remember who wrote it? Because Stan Cohn wrote a great book about it. A friend of mine. Uh, the no, game they played. And that yeah, was I, know that, uh, I don't know who. You could just put it in Amazon. 
Okay, uh, yeah. The city game, and they'll, 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 they'll give it to sure. you. Sure, I know, I know. Yeah. I just thought you knew. That's what I do. You lot. know everything. No, I don't, I don't know everything. <laughs> No, well, you know what? You, when you guys mentioned, you, you, know, know you guys everything. mentioned like CCNY and uh, and Brooklyn College and NYU and St. John's. I mean, uh, that was mecca. I mean, that was basketball heaven when you saw those teams. And you know, some and of the LIU schools LIU today. Too. I, I mean, LIU. yeah, NYU. If you talk to them today, and you mentioned you mentioned uh, you know Brooklyn College or CCNY or whatever NYU uh, as major LIU. basketball powers, they look like a, you're from Mars because they don't even know yeah. what you're talking about. Right. Yeah, and Long Island moment. University. Uh, they had uh, what's his name? Uh, I forget it. Another big, great, big ball player who was had a great NF, NA, NBA career. Uh, what, for what school? LIU, Long Island oh, University. Yeah. God, I don't, I don't really remember. Sure Sherman White. Sherman White. I think that guy. no. He was one of the guys that was involved. He was from uh, Clinton, and he played for City. My Sherman White played at LIU. Did he? Yeah. Sherman White. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, but he, yeah, know. but he was one of the guys because three of those guys had gone to Clinton, and so uh, uh, Sherman White. I remember the name very well, um, but I didn't. I didn't remember he'd gone to LIU. But there was uh, he was a big center. He, uh, anyway, go ahead, never mind. It's just no Ray Felix. Felix. Ray Felix. Thank you. Yes. Oh, right, yeah. Yes. That's oh yes. Was. He was not yeah. good. But we we, we, we used to have nice. pools. For how many times did he was fall on the floor during a game? <laughs> yeah, he um he was really was guy, not good. Um, uh, and then you we have can't get off the air without mentioning Charlie Tyree to complete D- Dumbo. His, <laughs> compl- we, call, Dumbo. we called him Dumbo because of the ears. All right, guys. Um, this has been a delight, as has every every interaction we've had for four years now we've been doing this so let's keep it going another 14 years how about that good i'm good i'm good yeah yep (laughs) be well everybody we'll do it a month from today um and um stay healthy and stay masked okay okay good night everybody Yep, good night. Good night. Ralph Tycho, Comfortably Zone Radio Network, Alan Blumkin, George Case the Third, Hal Bach, and David Hubler. Great sports talk show. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening, everybody. Adios. Adios. The proceeding has been a Comfortably Zoned Network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.